So thank you for joining us. And my final job this evening is to welcome Andrew, who's going to pray for us as we begin our, um, our webinar this evening. Over to you, Andrew. Um, should say that Positively Rural, before I do, is hosted by a team of people. Uh, and uh, Andrew and Caroline and myself uh, and Catherine are, are some of the team uh, who are here this evening. So please, if you need to contact us regarding anything um, directly in relation to this webinar, you now know the names. So to you, Andrew. Okay, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you on a cold um, winter evening. Um, when we're probably thankful that we don't have far to travel and uh, we can still be together and share together. So I thought I would share um, a prayer which is called a Thanksgiving for winter. Um, if you're like me, today has been a glorious day in North Yorkshire, but very, very cold and icy. Um, and uh, just that sense of being appreciative of what we see around us, which is one of the blessings of the rural communities that, that some of us will live in. Let's pray. God of beauty and grace, we thank you for all that winter brings to us, for revealing the stark beauty of a tree's outline and giving the wonder and intricacy of a flake of snow. We thank you for time to rest from mowing the lawn or from weeding the vegetable bed. A time to expectantly plan what seeds to plant in the season to come, but from the comfort of a cosy chair. We delight in playing in the snow, or at least in the hope that we might. We thank you for long dark nights when we can watch the moon rise, or appreciate the bright company of stars. We welcome the goose, the teal and the field fair as they visit our winter shores and woods and the snowdrop as it interrupts bleak January days with delicate beauty. We thank you for cold wintry walks when we can snuggle into our favourite scarf, look forward to a hot cup of tea in our hands and reminisce in front of the fire. We even thank you for those grey and wet mild days when the cold does not bite and we have a topic of conversation to take with us through the day. Lord, grant us the graciousness to see winter's gifts and enjoy Earth's quiet season. Amen. So we're going to hear um, from um, both of our contributors in due course, but first of all, I'm going to introduce uh, Maggie Patcher to us a little bit about herself and then share with us something about Chapman. See over to you, Maggie. Hey, good good evening. Um, I'm actually going to tell you a little bit more about myself um, in a little while, um, but I'm a Methodist deacon. Um, um, I have uh, served in several different rural appointments all totally different. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not used to, to doing this on a screen. I usually do do this sort of thing very interactively with people. So um, it's quite, quite different doing it like this. Um, I do have um, some slides. Uh, I wonder if you could put them on. Uh, yeah. That that's just the the view from where I lived in the Lake District. Um, if you want to move on to the next one, it'd be great. So, what what is rural? What do we mean by rural? And I'm sure that most of you who are here know this. Um, but it's anywhere that is outside of a town or a city, and they're classed mm -hmm. as where there's over ten thousand residents. So you can have some quite big villages or you can have tiny little hamlets and, and individual um, re residences as well. Um, the perception when, when you hear about rural um, and you read the nice glossy magazines or you see Escape to the Country on the television um, and it looks like it's all idyllic and lots of people, people with lots of money and big houses, um, but the reality is very, very different from that. Um, there's all sorts of different sorts of rural 
um, which I'm sure you know, and I've just put a few pictures up there. So we've, we've got um, farming, which, which is the first thing that comes to mind when, when we um, talk about rural um, farming communities, whether that's sheep farming or it's dairy farming or um, around here, there's quite a lot of agriculture um, and um, beef as well. <laughs> they keep cattle for beef. Um, but then we will have dif different sorts of rural as well. So it's not just about the farming. Um, where I live now um, is a place called Hedden on the Wall, just outside Newcastle. And it's uh, very much a commuter village for people who work in Newcastle. Um, but it's also a retirement place. There's an, a lot of bungalows. My son calls it bungalow land. Um, it starts the house after ours. Um, there's there's lots of bungalows and it's where people come um, to retire and, and I know that some of the other places like Grassington uh, is another place where um, when I was working around there um, they were said the congregation size there doesn't change because um, people come to retire and yes um, they, they might die and, and move on but new people are always coming in as well. Um, and then where I was for the last five years before I've moved here um, was in the Lake District, which is very rural and yes, has sheep farming, but the main industry is tourism. Um, so it's, it's a, a different sort of rurality really. So everywhere is different. Um, and like I say, where I am here in Hedden, we actually have a mixture of everything in this village because we've got three farms in or uh, very close to the village. We've got commuters, we've got retirement people. Because we're on Hadrian's Wall, we also get tourists. The, the reality of rural life um, is um, not what a, a lot of people who live in the towns, and I'm sure that you, you know this as well, um, long working hours, often um, unsociable hours, um, and that's both farming and tourism. A lot of loan working. Um, for commuters, they may have long days and they come back home to, to their village on an evening. They've got um, family life to sort out. Um, families, as they grow up, move away because there isn't the things for them to do in the villages networks that they have are often not local networks but but maybe more online or social networks where they they go and meet people not connected with the village where they live and then retirees as well um you know to totally different um lifestyle to the farming community for example so the pressures and the stresses on a lot of people who live in rural communities um, are quite often not seen by those who don't know about rural rural life really and they think it's it's all lovely and you know the tourists come and they say oh isn't this beautiful here um, without realizing the stress and the strain of the people trying to run a and b um, particularly for the last few years during lockdowns um, in Ambleside, for example, almost every hotel in the in the town changed hands in the last few years. Um, the, there's there's been an awful lot of, of um, strain and stress and anxiety and worry, and still is. Um, they're short of workers um, for for all sorts of reasons. Um, so those that are running their own businesses are working all the time. Um, Probably now, January is about the only time they get any time off um, because a lot of places shut in January and they go away or they do some renovations. Um, OK, so um, can we move on to the next slide? Do do feel free to interrupt me um, at any time if you want to, uh, because I, I, I do find this quite difficult talking to uh, myself, really. Um, so chaplaincy, um, what is chaplaincy? The, the pictures here um, are actually both from um, different places in the Lake District where I was the chaplain to people working in the tourism industry. 
um, it was something that was new that we were trying to to develop and get off the ground. Um, obviously, in the five years I was there, we had um, COVID and we had so much of the tourist industry closed for a long time. Um, so it was it was actually quite difficult. But um, chaplaincy is about going to where people are. It's about taking ministry outside beyond the walls of the church. It's going and meeting people where they are. Um, the the top picture there, I'm actually was invited in um, on a weekly basis to go and have breakfast with the staff after they'd finished serving the guests. So they had like a breakfast bar and, and I would go in and the, the staff that were able to would sit down together. And um, so it was an opportunity to get to know them. Um, some of the hotel managers were absolutely brilliant and invited me in to do things like that. Others didn't want to know. The chaplaincy is, is about going where you're invited. It's about being the guest, not the host. Um, so it's putting you in a, a place of vulnerability um, rather than a, a position of power. Um, it's about being an intentional presence. Um, some people say loitering with intent. Um, but it's about going um, and showing people that, you know, will, uh, and particularly in the in the Lake District and, and probably in farming communities as well to, to a great extent, um, whatever you do, there, there should be no expectation that they're ever going to turn up at church, which doesn't go down well with a lot of our small congregations who think you've come um, and you're going to go out there and you're going to tell people um, about God and they're going to want to come to church on a Sunday morning. Um, and that just is not the reality at all. Um, it's about going out and seeing where is God already at work and how can we join in with what God might be doing there. It's about listening and listening intentionally, listening um, carefully um, with your whole attention. It's about building relationships. Uh, it's about letting others lead the conversation, um, getting alongside people. Um, it's about giving them hope. Um, particularly, I found that when um, through through the COVID times and when they started to open up again, um, such stress that people were working under. And, and it's about, well, can, can we offer some hope to people? Um, can we help them to, to see things differently um, and, to, and to move on? One of the things, if you could put the next slide on for me. Um, we had um, some, some leaflets um, that we gave out. I don't know if you can see this, um, that, that I took with me and some little cards um, that explained to people what a chaplain was. And this is, this is what it, it said on them. Um, we, we actually um, translated this into a whole lot of different languages because in the tourism industry in the Lake District, there was a lot of international people working there. Um, and that's one, one of the, the issues that, that's come up now. But it's, it's about um, how, do you, how do you start conversations with people whose English isn't very good? Um, so I used to go, one of the things I did, um, we had English classes um, going on as well. So I used to go along to the English classes and get to know people and get them to translate this into different languages for each other, um, which really helped. Okay, so if you wanna move on to the next slide. Um, so I said I'd say a little bit more about myself. Um, I'm a, a Methodist deacon um, and I have spent the last nine years um, where I've been here in the UK, um, in various rural appointments, and I've spelt that wrong, sorry. <laughs> um, so I started off um, working in, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, 
across three circuits um, in uh, North Yorkshire around Airedale, Skipton and Grassington and Settle. And I noticed that there's some people from the, that area there, including Jim, who um, I worked with very much when I was there. Um, it was a, a different, so I wasn't really doing chaplaincy work there, but so, some of what I was doing was very, very similar um, in what I was trying to do was work with the smallest of the, the churches in that area across the three circuits um, to help them to see how they could engage more with their communities and, and what they needed to to um, how they needed to look in a different way at things. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute. Um, then I so I spent three years doing that. Um, and for those of you who know how rural ministry works um, and chaplaincy as well, it's about getting to know people, as I've said, building relationships with people. Um, rural change can take a long, long time. And I was um, there sort of in a consultancy type role. Um, so in some places, things work well. And in other places, it was a, a little more difficult. Um, but there was there were some good outcomes um, in quite a few places anyway. Um, from there, I moved to or I was sent to um, the Lake District um, to the South Lake. So around Windermere and Ambleside and Hawk's Head, um, all the lovely places. Absolutely beautiful. I mean, I've been so blessed to have worked in the Yorkshire Dales in the Lake District. And now I'm on the edge of the uh, Northumberland. Um, so I feel very blessed in that. Um, to explain a bit more about the chaplaincy to the tourism industry, we've got a little video and I think now would be a good time to show that. As the chaplain for people working in the tourism industry, um, what I do is um, I, I just visit people where they're working in their workplaces. So I'll go and call in the hotels or the B&Bs, um, the cafes, and of course, the Windermere Lake cruise people as well. So do you enjoy your job? A little bit, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. How, how long have you been doing it? Yeah. When we first opened up after the, the first lockdown, um, and I went by um, one place and just wanted to talk to the receptionist and she'd been all smiles and, and welcoming people and as was her job uh, and when I got to her I just said and how are you and she nearly dissolved in tears she says you're the first person that has asked how I am today and she's just doing this amazing job and that's what we're there for to help people who are struggling and just to show them that we care about them What I try and do is, is just bring God's love into that place to show them God cares for them, God loves them. It's not about um, explicitly talking about faith. The conversation is always led by the other person. So if they want to talk about their faith, about where is God in this, then I'll follow that conversation through. The pandemic has been really hard on the tourism industry and um, there's so many places just now when it's really quiet they're okay but as soon as it starts to get busy again they are so understaffed, so stressed with the work. So it's just about holding them in prayer that, that they will be able to cope with whatever comes their way, that they will be able to smile at people and welcome people and do their job. Um, whatever's going on that that also that we can some way help them to see that God is there in this with them thank you um I've got a, a few pictures I think what might be a good idea is just to show the the pictures on the slides first and then I'll I'll talk um a bit uh, about them well, we'll put, if you put the, first, the next one up. Um, so um, I'm sure Jim will recognize some of these pictures. These are from when I was um, in um, the um, North Yorkshire area. 
So one of the places was Malham. Um, what what I did there is so chaplaincy is about getting alongside people, getting to know people, building relationships. Um, Malham has this safari every year, um, which is an amazing thing for tourism. Um, and they get thousands and thousands of people um, come over a few days. Um, but the preparation for it takes a long time and a lot of effort. So what I did was um, I went and got involved with those who were organising it. Um, we had meetings once a month and um, planning it, what was going to be the theme. It was really interesting actually listening to, to um, uh, grown men talking about... Um, Get, getting excited about fairy tales and making models of characters out of fairy tales. It was lovely. Um, and then we had the 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 cafe. Um, and what we did, we worked together with others. So it wasn't just the 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 Methodist Church took a turn at it, the Anglicans, the WI, um, everybody got involved in what was going on. So it was a really good way of getting to know people, getting alongside people, working with them. Um, and, and just showing them, where, having those conversations as and when the opportunity came up. Um, chaplaincy is about making space for those conversations to happen as well. So um, the pictures at the bottom, um, the one on the right is um, the lambing service, which happens um, in different places at different times of the year. It's quite interesting. They have it quite late in the, in the Lake District. Um, when all the lambs have grown and been sold, whereas here they had it quite early and, and had a little baby lamb in. Um, so it's, it's done differently in different places. But having that service in the barn on the farm meant that a lot of people came along that would you would never get in a church anyway. Um, from conversations that we had, we then decided um, in one place to have harvest on the farm, which is the other picture there and there was uh, everybody seated on the hay bales in the farm and we're talking about um harvest and pictures of the area in the past and and food to share obviously and um, that's what you do you sit down and you talk around food um so th those were a couple of examples of making space um working with others i think if you show the next slide as well This, this is actually um, in Cross Hills, um, where again, we worked together with the other churches in the area, with the schools. Um, and uh, we had somebody went into each of the schools and teach the children a song. And then they all came together in the park one Sunday afternoon. And thankfully the sun shone, it was great. Uh, and all the families were out in the park as well. So again, it's an opportunity. Um, Yes, going into the schools, getting to know the people in the schools, but also getting to know the families and um, going to where they were. If we'd had this in a church, it wouldn't have happened in the same way at all. So having it in, in a community space um, was really, really good. Um, and the next picture, again, um, making space, getting to know people. Um, finding opportunities where you can sit with people and talk. So these pictures, um, the two of them with people on them are from Holiday at Home, which we did. Um, getting people who were on their own, living on their own, not going out uh, away on holidays. And, and we just, we had um, transport provided so that we could pick people up if they were needed to be collected um, and brought them together for a few days. Um, and was just there alongside them. Um, the picture at the bottom um, was actually a couple that um, came on holiday to Hawkshead um, every year um, and asked me if I would marry them in the little Methodist chapel there. And it was very, very small. It was just um, her parents and their two children um, and his mum, and that was it. Um, very, very small little wedding, but they just felt that this was a place that meant something to them and where they wanted to, to get married. And they, they stayed in touch with me ever since, which is absolutely lovely. Um, there's all sorts of other things um, that we've done. I think if you take the slides off and I can just talk. <laughs>
Um, do feel free to, to interrupt me. I think we've only got a couple of minutes left, though, haven't we? Um, tell me when to stop somebody, please. <laughs> Um, because I could I could carry on. Um, one of one of the things with the tourism um, was about going to where people were. So going and calling in at the B&Bs, knocking on the doors, picking the right time of the day, because some of them were busy in the mornings and some of them didn't like to be disturbed in the afternoon because that was the only bit of spare time that they got. Um, going in the cafes. But if they were really busy recognizing that and not wanting to stop and chat with them, just saying, hello, hi, I'm here, waving at them. Um, when when I was moving on and going, um, the pe people were, uh, it amazed me actually, um, people that I hadn't, hadn't got to know that well, um, but I'd called in uh, on a regular basis and just said, you know, hi, I'm here if you need me. Um, and they were actually really, upset because I was going and they said well it's just been great to know that you're there if we need you um one of the other things that we did with with the the hotels we would go in and talk with the managers um and quite often I would get the manager phone me up and say I've got a member of staff that would really do with a chat with you um and that happened quite quite a lot as well um so it's it's about getting known who you are. Um, I mean, one of the other things chaplains do is, is turn up at all the, the village events, um, the the Christmas events, um, just be there so that you get your face known so people know who you are and know what you do and know you're there for them if they need you. Um, have I got to stop? Is it eight o'clock? I think we're about to. Is it the one last thing he wants to say? Um just that it is it is it can be really hard work um i find it quite difficult going um especially at the beginning when i don't know people going and talking to them but it is so rewarding when you 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 know that people have been able to share i mean after the covid stuff the stories that i was told were heartbreaking um but knowing that you were there for them to to actually be able to share that with Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for all of that. Um, I do really appreciate your sharing um, and honesty about um, the joys and the challenges of, of chaplaincy. Um, Maggie's giving us some questions. We're going to go into breakout rooms. The questions should now be in the chat. They are just see them appear. I'll just read them out and then um, you'll be asked to join a, join a group. Um, I think, as, as we said earlier, there aren't facilitators in the group. So just um, talk amongst yourselves. We tend to say on this, if actually something else has struck you from the presentation and you'd rather talk about that, then don't be too tired by the questions, but they're a starting point for us. So the questions are, what do you feel are the most important things to consider when involved with rural chaplaincy? How might you go about developing this ministry? And then we hear about rural isolation and rural poverty and the effects these have on mental health in rural communities. In what ways might you or your congregation or church respond to those needs in your area? So we've got about 10 minutes um, in the breakout groups, and we shall see you back here uh, fairly shortly. Okay, but before we before we go into our next chat, I'm going to introduce, uh, introduce our next speaker. We're delighted to have uh, Maggie Ellison with us, who is an agricultural chaplain at the York, York Auction Centre. So over to you, Maggie. Thank you. Um, can we have the first slide, please? Thank you. Um, well, I'm I'm actually a market chaplain at the York Option Mart. Um, I'm not going to talk about the theology of chaplaincy, but I will talk about the concept of where I work, what it means, and just at the end, a little bit about what I think I'm doing. OK, so how did it come about? Can we have the next slide? There have been chaplaincy, agricultural market chaplaincy in other parts of the country, but this is about North Yorkshire or the Yorkshire area, rather. Um, from about 2003, the Church's Regional Commission for Yorkshire and the Humber was working. They delivered support and development work amongst farming communities in the Yorkshire Dales and across the North York Moors. Now, these can be very isolated areas. Um, the work was um, 
independently evaluated, and it was rated very highly, particularly in terms of the engagement with farmers, because farmers tend to steer clear of the more conventional sources of support. They don't do very well going to the doctors. They don't do very well um, going to seek support themselves. And the work was deemed also to be very effective, partnership working, working in partnership with local churches and particularly the Farming Community Network, the FCN, which is a farming charity which seeks to walk with farmers, providing support, not actively giving money out, not like the RABI, but very much walking with farmers. Um, unfortunately, the Church's Com Regional Commission for Yorkshire and the Humber folded and they were really worried that that positive work at the Marts, particularly at Thirsk, would um, cease. And so the Yorkshire Church's Rural Business Support was established to try to address this identified need for having a presence in the auction marts. So can we have the next slide? Well, that's a picture of the York auction mart. Um, and that's the logo for the Yorkshire Church's Rural Business Support. Market chaplaincy is really about being that presence in the livestock markets. It's very it's like in hospitals and in school, like what Maggie's been describing about in the Lake District. There are the farmers, but there are the dealers, the hauliers, the vets, the trading standard officers, the drovers, the auctioneers, the accounts office staff, and of course the catering team, which is really important. And those are the people that we deal with. Through these people, we're reaching out into very rural, often isolated agricultural communities, and these people who come to the market week by week. And we're there to serve everyone, offering a friendly chat, a listening ear, and practical support through the ups and downs of everyday life. Well, how did I come to be a chaplain? I don't actually remember when I started. I could have gone rummaging back through my diaries, but I honestly can't remember. I was approached by the Bishop of Selby, who carries the um, rural brief for the Diocese of York. I was approached by him on behalf of the, um, you kind know, of it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? The Yorkshire Church's Rural Business Support Organisation, um, and, and asked if I would consider doing this. I've been an Anglican self-supporting priest uh, working in a rural benefice but this was a totally new direction. I'd never been I'd driven past York Auction Centre hundreds of times, but I'd never actually been there. I didn't really know what goes on. My background is hospital nursing. So I guess I am used to talking to people from all different backgrounds, but I've always steered clear of hospital chaplaincy because it was always a bit too close to home. And I'm not a farmer's daughter or a farmer's wife, but my husband worked well for the National Farmers Union all his career. So obviously I've met, I've heard a lot about the ups and downs and the trials and tribulations of farming. Mm. And I've met many farmers over the years. Across Yorkshire, there are 14 auction marts or markets. I'm never quite sure what, at this one, we call it themselves the market, but I know some places are called marts. I'm not quite sure what distinguishes what. I think it depends where you are. Um, when we started, a few were already, had a, they'd appointed chaplains already. York is a busy place, and so they decided to appoint two of us. They appointed um, Reverend Chris Humble, so, who some of you all know, a Methodist minister, and myself. And when Chris moved on, Elizabeth Cushion, who is now the Methodist minister in the Poppleton area, um, she is now my fellow chaplain. Howard Petch, again, who some of you all know, he did a lot of groundwork on behalf of the Yorkshire Church's Rural Business Support. And he arranged a meeting for Chris and myself to go with Howard to meet James Stevenson, the senior partner, the valuer, and the auctioneer whose family, um, well, they started and they manage um, the York Auction Centre. We had an extremely positive response. We were really welcomed into the role. We were given an official name badge with the logo on it, 
So we had a sense right from day one of belonging. So can we have the next slide? Now, some of you may not have no idea what goes on in the market. So I just put in a few slides to give you some ideas. Well, it's a busy place, lots of people. Farmers tell me that it's not as busy with livestock as it used to be because more farmers now are having direct contracts. So their animals go like straight to the abattoir. They don't come through the market system. There are two main um, cattle sales a week. On the Monday, it's the butcher's market or the red market. No. And on a Thursday, it's the stall cattle where um, calves are, some Just farmers- finish at nine. Sorry, I- But that'll be all right. Sorry, is somebody talking? I can hear somebody talking. Um, on the Thursday, it's the stall cattle, stall um, cattle, because some farmers pretend to just look after calves. Some prefer them at different different sizes, different um, sizes, ages. So they tend to buy and sell. So they've got their own um, cattle. Then there are occasional sales. Can I have the next? Oh yeah, we've got sheep sales. Lots of people, that's what I wanted you to get the impression of. There are lots of people there. And the next slide, we've got pig sales. And the next slide, and then we've got the occasional sales, the annual Christmas fat stock show, which is really a big one where you get prize bulls, etc. cetera. Um, you've got the rare breed sale, which happens a couple of times a year where you get people coming from miles and miles and miles around exhibiting their animals. The Christmas um, poultry sale, again, it's the Joe public who come to that, and it's really busy. And the next slide. And then they've also had machinery sales. On Wednesday, the 8th of February, we have the Yorkshire um, machinery sale, machinery show, which is enormous. It is absolutely, people come from miles around fantastic machinery those of you who've seen it at the great yorkshire show tractors i mean they cost thousands now big big stuff um, and then we also have used um continuously really they seem to have second-hand machinery sales many of which are now online at merton they also have car boot sales um they now are in partnership with another um set of value um valuers and they have they now have a proper furniture and antique sales room. And then above all that, they've got this lorry park. So we have lorries parking overnight and they provide um, showers and meals. So it's a busy place. And I know, well, I'll come on to that in a minute. We go, I normally go on a Thursday to the store sale and we might well have 80, 100, 120 people in the ring looking at sales so really you're meeting a lot of people so can we have the next slide thank you this is um what the official role of a chaplain is um for um york market chaplains so i thought i'd just run through it we're in well to provide an effective christian presence we build on relationships based on trust confidentiality and sensitivity with all those who work in the auctions. Um, we develop a broad understanding of the key issues that impact the lives of the farming community. We demonstrate empathy and good humor. There is a lot of banter in the market, so you have to be prepared for that. Um, develop a knowledge of sources of help and support. We signpost people to other organizations who can help and support um, different areas of trouble where they're having problems. We have the full cooperation and support of the directors of the Mart, and we are definitely there at their invitation. Um, it's ecumenical, and I work with Elizabeth, who's a Methodist, but we have people from, um, you need to have a Christian, um, you have to be in sympathy with the, with the Christian faith, definitely, because that's what we're about. Um, and we are ordained clergy some people the market is within their parish so they are stipendiary some are self-supporting some are retired and then some or well, quite a few are retired um, lay volunteers or a combination of both and it's really good we find it very useful to have more than one of us 
because as I come on now, I'm just going to be talking in a minute about what we actually do. Can we go on to the next slide? Thank you. Um, that's a picture of Elizabeth and myself. So what do we actually do? Well, we're there, we're a reliable presence. And there really is an expectation that one of us will be there. We go on Thursdays, Thursdays is the social day. It's when the retireds come, it's the store cattle. You get many people in rural areas. We've heard uh, Maggie talk about social isolation. The pub has gone. The churches might have a, a service once a month. You've lost that those local places where people meet. And so the market is really, really important for people to come and socialise. Um, and that's why we go on a Thursday, because people sit around and they come with their problems. I've, you can see the canteen. We go... We have time to talk to people, to farmers, to the staff, to visitors. We dress appropriately. You certainly don't go dressed up when you go to a livestock market. You put on um, trainers or walking boots and um, fairly scruffy clothes. We go in, we watch the sales, watch the, cat, the um, carbs being sold, then go in the main ring to watch the cattle being sold. Um, there's the canteen, go and get a cup of tea, cup of coffee, just see who's around, sit and talk, um, and then over lunch as well. So I've put two cups sitting, two hands there with a, a cup. We sit there, we talk, we talk about the weather, we talk about what's happening in the country, the pandemic, the national state of the National Health Service, we talk about politics, we talk about illegal immigrants, we talk about the state of farming. Farming is going through a really difficult time now. You'll be aware that the subsidies are being cut. Farmers, I was saying that a lot of the, um, a lot of less farm, less, less animals are coming through the market system. And the bigger farmers often don't use the market system. So the market system ten, tends to be the smaller, more vulnerable farmers. And that's important for us to remember. Um, so many of them have got worries about finance. Um, we're all having problems with finance, and of course, farmers are no different. The costs of fertilizer have just absolutely rocketed the cost of fuel, a lack of workers. The problems are multi multiple, manif really multiple. They have personal problems. They may have individual health concerns. Um, Many of them now know that I was a nurse, so I do get asked a lot of medical questions <laughs> and I point them in the direction of the GPs. Um, they may have problems with the increasing dependency of ageing relatives, relationship issues, especially so like splitting up with a spouse, arguments with family members about the farm, succession planning, cash flow problems. Gradually over time, and that's what the handshake is supposed to be, we really build up relationships and we have ongoing conversations. It depends, but you have to keep doing this. I've been doing it now for five or so years. You have to be there. It is a ministry of presence. And you never know when I go on a Thursday, what's going, what, what's going to happen. It's amazing what the, um, what comes up sometimes. A lot of times it's just pure banter, passing the time of day, um, they often rib, rib me, but, you know, that's what life is. But then all of a sudden you can have a really deep question and you're there to help them. So can we have the next um, slide? So we signpost to different organisations. Um, we have no blank checkbook to solve all their financial problems. That's, but I had to make that quite clear right at the start. But we can signpost them to the Farming Community Network, to the Royal Agricultural Benevolent Institution, um, who we have a lot of their pamphlets. On occasions, I have referred, with, obviously with consent, I have referred people to them for help and support. Um, I often refer people, well, tell them, advise people to go and see their GPs um, because they don't 
farming community, they tend to be isolated. They tend not to want, they want to get on with things. They're used to treating the animals and they think things will get better, but they do need to look after themselves as well. We have the Samaritans phone numbers, which are really important because the farming community, unfortunately, have one of the highest suicide rates um, of any um, uh, um, occupational group because they have the, the wherewithal to do things. Um, citizens' advice is important, and the Yorkshire Agricultural Society have been tremendously supportive. Um, they provided us with Christmas cards. They do health checks from time to time when farmers can come and get their blood pressure checked, their blood sugars checked, um, seeking, you know, get, getting help and advice. And they also provide business support for which people can access. So, and then I put the church symbols because obviously, too, um, you know, we, we we will talk to on, on people's behalf. So obviously, it's all done with consent. Um, it's all done in confidence, but sometimes we will talk to relevant um, vicars or um, Methodist ministers or whoever on behalf of somebody. When I first started, I can remember going in the first morning. I'd never been to a market before. I had been shown around when I went to um, to see the um, James. I went in wearing a dog collar and the, the reaction to it, what on earth, what are we there for? Are we there to proselytise? Are we there to make new converts? And we had to say, no, we're just there to be have a listening ear. Early on, there was a tragedy amongst a member of staff and I was approached by management to come in and talk to some of the staff. And then fairly soon afterwards, there was a suicide um, of a farmer. And I was told about it by other farmers and I was able to get to know the family and be there for them. And I think those two events together really made people value having chaplains. There was a real sense of community amongst the regulars there, just as is as there is in a church or a pub, and they look out for each other. And if somebody's missing, they'll want to know where they are. And certainly if somebody's missing, we'll be told about it. So can I have the next slide? So I was thinking about the highs and the lows. Well, the highs. In the last year, we had a farmer who was critically injured. He was helicoptered off air, Yorkshire Air Ambulance. They didn't think he'd survive following a, an accident with a cow and a calf. And the, everybody was you know, praying for this chap, um, talking about him. And here he is, he's still, he's come back. He's an elderly gentleman with his Zimmer frame. And he comes now on a Thursday again to market and it's wonderful to see him back again. And that real sense of community welcoming him back as one of the lost was just wonderful. Getting farmers back on or seeing farmers get back on an even keel after difficult times is wonderful. Um, not that long ago, somebody was just sitting next to me and I didn't know who they were. And we were just talking. And then it transpired that their mother had died three days earlier. And so you're able to be there to support them, um, giving them help, support, how to go about, you know, making arrangements, etc. I've been take, asked to take funerals. Um, I have to be very aware of boundaries because York Auction Mart isn't within my parish. And we have, you know, referred on. Um, but then equally, I mean, I do rural I do farmers funerals in our own parishes but you know, I, you have to be aware of boundaries and how where you you know roles of um, ministry a lot of banter um I was talking to somebody we had a carol service that oh I'll, I'll come back to the archbishop in a minute we have a carol service every year which the RABI use and I was chatting to, the morning of our carol service this year I was chatting to somebody why would I want to come to carol service? It's a waste of time. I don't believe any of that nonsense. And there he was that evening. He was there. And it's fantastic when that happens. The Archbishop of York, some of you will know, he did a pilgrimage all around the diocese a few years ago, Sentamu. And he, I was asked to arrange a visit for him to come to York Auction Mart. And it was the rare breed sale. And it was wonderful because the rare breed sale attract people from... Well, I mean, your auction mark attracts people from 30, 40 miles radius. 
But on this occasion, people came from Lancashire and everywhere. And seeing Sentimu, it was just amazing um, how he was um, welcomed. And he auctioned some um, birds and he auctioned, a, uh, um, I think he sold a, a sheep. And I'm sure they got far, he got far more for the animals than anybody else would. And then the Christmas cards I've got here. This is what um, Yorkshire Agricultural um, Society did for us. Giving out Christmas cards when somebody says, this is, might be the only Christmas card that I get this year. And on the back of the Christmas card, you can see we ensure that every farmer um, got all the, the helplines details, which is really important. Um, oh, and then I mean, there's a lot more to say. The low side is seeing people really struggling. And then um, how do I see the role of market chaplaincy? That's what the candle's about. A frontier ministry in a social setting rather than church building, engaging with people directly in the nitty gritty of their lives. Um, I like Anne Morrissey. I like her work. And I think very much... Um, See, Alan Morrissey saw a community chaplain as representing and occasionally speaking of God's alongsidedness in daily life. And for me, it's carrying the light of Christ whilst walking and being with people, whatever their circumstances. And if anybody's interested, I know that there are people, we need some um, market chaplains in some areas and marts over in the West Yorkshire particularly. And we welcome anybody who's interested in and commit to going. You have to be fairly regular, but lay people or ordained, you're very, very welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maggie. Thank you for um, sharing about your experiences of um, chaplaincy. We're going to go back into our breakout rooms. I'm just checking on the screen. So. We're going to go back into our um, breakout rooms. There are two questions again, and Catherine will put those in the chat. Um, the first question is about um, environmental things. Um, in 2020, the Church of England voted to achieve net zero carbon by 2030. The Methodist Church has done the same, um, recognising that the global climate crisis is a crisis for God's creation and a fundamental injustice. The question is, is it right for Christians to be working as market chaplains along livestock farmers who are contributing to the problem. I, I question whether they're all contributing to the problem, but anyway, that's the question that's been set. And the second one, which is a really interesting one that both of you have actually mentioned about this, an evangelical Christian told me that market chaplaincy is a waste of time and not part of the mission and ministry of the church, which is to make converts. Do you agree? I, I like that question, which would amount to any chaplaincy. So we're going to, you're going to be asked to go into your groups. Um, the questions will come up in the chat and we'll be back in about um, 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, the first one is about lay and ordained chaplaincy. We've sort of uh, touched on this already, but I wonder if Maggie or Maggie would like to say something about the way in which chaplaincy can embrace both um, lay and ordained people. Yeah, fine. Um, one one of the um, things that that I did in the in the Lake District, we we actually ran training for lay people um for volunteers to come and um assist in the chaplaincy. Um it didn't we 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 did have some I had I had about three or four people helping me initially um but kind of COVID kind of got in the way of everything. Um but but we did we actually did the workplace chaplaincy training which is very good. Um, there's online training that you can do for <coughs> chaplains and um, lay people are absolutely brilliant at doing mm. it. Um, people, it's just anybody that has got a bit of time that they're willing to to um, commit to. Um, like Maggie said, uh, it needs to be um, on a regular basis. You need need to be there, um, and um, anyone can do it. You don't have to be ordained at all. Thank you for that. Um, just to reflection, we were chatting a little bit while we were in the group, which was about the way in which part of chaplaincy is about going into someone else's space. Often our church idea is about inviting people into our space. I wonder if, if um, one of you wants to say a bit about, you know, how we go about being in someone else's space and how that changes the dynamic of, of our conversations, perhaps. Maybe, uh, Alison, do you want to say something about that? Well, I think you just have to go with the flow, don't you? I mean, there are, I didn't say, but obviously... I mean, I, 
you know, we're, we're there very much there at the um, request of and as as invitation as um, invitees of the management of the market. And I think, you know, I wear a dog collar, but obviously lay people don't. And then we had a badge of office, um, but people know you now, so that doesn't matter. But you are there as a guest. And um, I think, you know, that's an important thing to remember. What I didn't say is sometimes you can get extremely right wing views, um, which I can't, you know, I, you have to stand up and counter those. Um, some of the farmers ha have very extreme views. And as a Christian, I have to give my Christian point of view, obviously. So when I don't, I can't agree with what you're saying. But these are farmers, not the management. But you are there as guests of the management, definitely. Okay. Can I ask a question about support? Because obviously, um, both of you have shared about, you know, sometimes you end up, people are dumping all their stuff onto you. Where, where is the support in chaplaincy? Um, yeah, I mean, I've had um, both when I was in um, Yorkshire and in the Lake District, um, a small support group um, specifically around the project that I was involved in. Um, in Cumbria, um, somebody asked in the chat, um, who's the chaplain for the chaplains? Cumbria, they have a chaplain to the chaplains. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not just oh. the um, rural chaplains, it's the hospital chaplains, uh, everything. Um, they get together every now and then, um, he stays in touch with us. Um, and it, that that was really good support. And of course, if you're um, well, a Methodist, um, you've got your circuit staff as well and, and your, 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 your um, leadership teams and, and things like that. So there, there are people around for you to, to go to and take. Um, if you've got issues and don't know where to go, um, there are people there that you can share it with confidentially, of course. And similarly with the market and chaplaincy, we meet um, the, oh, I can never remember, the Yorkshire Church's Rural Business Support, the network of chaplains. We meet up probably three times a year on video, on um, Zoom. We all go to the um, Yorkshire show and they put on a series of seminars for us. There's a real sense of support there. And there are people that we can go to. If there's a, I mean, I know I've done it too. When I know I'm, you know, is this right or is it wrong? What should we do? But I mean, I've got a fellow chaplain. You know, there are people around you, definitely. And of course, my own parish um, and people within, you know, the, the deanery. Thank you. There was, there was a question asked about, um, somebody was saying they were fellow new to chaplaincy and asking about the particular characteristics of chaplaincy. I, I, I sense as we've chatted, we recognise there is, there's a lot of overlap between what we might define as chaplaincy in a specific role and, and ministries which lots of lay and ordained mm. people have. Um, maybe if you could both say one thing that for you is really specific to your chaplaincy role or to a chaplaincy role rather than that general ministry role. Um, um, I think that we've, we've both said it, it's about um, a ministry of presence, about being there, for people about listening to them that's really really important mm -hmm. and and letting the other person lead the conversation it's not about us telling people anything it's just about being there and and building relationships with people and I suppose for in the market chaplaincy it's obviously having some understanding or interest in agriculture and um, well, yeah. you know problems of farming obviously yeah, that that was definitely um, mm. with the the um, tourism stuff as well. Yeah. Um, the fact that my way 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 back, my dad used to run some hotels. Um, that gave me a little bit of cred. <laughs> okay, but we, we're gonna we're gonna draw the questions to a close. I, I haven't seen anyone else desperate with their hand up. Um, can I just say a really big thank you to to Maggie and Maggie for what they've shared. We much appreciate it, and thank you to you for being here. I'm going to hand over to. to Caroline, who's going to um, draw us um, draw the session to a close. Hello, and um, thank you to, to Maggie's. The next session is on the 26th of April. Uh, it's quite a different focus. We're looking at equality and diversity and inclusion in rural areas. So uh, very, a bit of a step change, but I think it'll be a really good opportunity in its broadest terms to help us think about the rural context and how we see equality, diversion, inclusion. Um, but uh, as we near the end of our time together, just to pray 
for for each of us uh, for our chaplains and those in chaplaincy as well so let us pray mm. heavenly father we just give you thanks for the great gift of technology that from all the communities where we serve that we are united by your spirit we thank you for the way in which Maggie and Maggie have shared their learning, their ministry, their insights into chaplaincy. So we pray for them and for their chaplaincy colleagues and for those chaplains who we know. We thank you for the opportunities to be present in varying contexts to hear the stories of those with whom we move. We thank you that through the vehicle of chaplaincy, stories are shared, burdens are shared, worries are halved. We thank you that in this encounter, that we have an opportunity to make Christ known, to share his love and to be Christ amongst all whom we live and work and worship with. So Lord, as we end this time together, we pray bless each of us that peace may be in our homes, a restful night, refreshment for a new day always to the glory of your name in jesus christ our lord amen <laughs>